This is Paul Schneiderman today on the 34th edition of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Today we have a very special guest, an author, philanthropist, professor, and retired attorney, Jeff Raceley. Um, Jeff, I'm going to give you more of an introduction in a minute. And did I pronounce your last name correctly? Yes, you did. Great. Long a, so you're one of the few who got it right. Well, it made my day. Uh, today I have a special engineer, Daniel Billis, been helping me more on this show now for over a year, and we just had James Gerd come in and help a minute ago. I want to mention there's a lot of good things going on at Rainier Avenue Radio. We're a Seattle-based show. We're on the World Wide Web. We have an audience around the world. Our sports department has uh, my show, Sports and Stuff. We have Rick Dupree's great show, One on One with Dupe. Granville Emerson and Ronald Laurent, also known as Pepe, are the co-hosts of the fun show Lidline Sports. Masvita Murari is a, ho- co- is a host of Seattle Sports Weekly. Mark Bryant has a sports fitness-based show, Fitness Corner. Pat McCarthy hosts a new show on the Seattle Metro High School Athletic Conference. Jeff, I'm going to give you more of an introduction here. Um, Jeff Raceley has written about nine books, including a couple books on sports-related subjects we're going to go into today. Monsters of the Midway, a... Of 1969, Sex, Drugs, Rock and Roll, Vietnam, Civil Rights and Football. Jeff also wrote a 2016 book, Hero's Journey, John Ritter, The Chip Hilton of Goshen, Indiana, a memoir. Right away, I'll let the listeners know, we're not talking about the late actor John Ritter. This is a different John Ritter. Jeff is a graduate of the University of Chicago, Indiana University School of Law. Jeff practiced law for about 30 years until his retirement in about 2010. Jeff also has a degree from the Christian Theological Seminary. Jeff is a director a Besa Village Foundation. He's a liaison for the Nepal-based Himalayan Expedition Company, Adventure GEO Travels LTD. Jeff teaches a class in philosophy of philanthropy at Butler University. Jeff serves as, as a director of six nonprofits. Today we're going to learn more about Jeff's work, his career, and his thoughts about some sports issues. We're not going to be able to get into everything today, but we're going to have some fun getting some subjects. Jeff, thank you for coming on Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio. Thanks for having me, Paul. Absolutely. Jeff, do you remember that great 1980s comedy movie with Chevy Chase, Fletch? <laughs> yeah. Uh, fighting through some cobwebs to go back that far, but yes, yeah, kind of. Okay. Well, Ch- Chevy Chase plays a character in that movie who gets involved in about everything imaginable as part of the comedy. So, Jeff, I want to share with you that you, you seem to have a little fletch in you in a good way, that you're, you've, you're very multidimensional. You're involved in many different things. So how did you as a guy growing up in Gosham, Indiana, become so interested in so many different subjects? <laughs> Probably because my life in, and it's pronounced Goshen, uh, my life in Goshen was so narrow. Uh, it's, a, it's a small town, all white community. Uh, most everybody uh, were wasps. And so uh, I was uh, very happy to get out of there and lead a much more adventuresome and diverse life once I escaped. And, and I reading your book, Jeff, about John Ritter, which we're going to go into in a few minutes, but growing up in Goshen, Indiana, um, it really had a an impact on you, didn't it? Oh, very much so, yeah. I, I, I carry my hometown with me in my heart and mind uh, every day. Yeah, I could just kind of tell that, Jeff, reading about you online and a couple of the books I read. You, you definitely are an Indiana guy, and you've spent most of your life in Indiana. And, Jeff, you've organized treks in the Himalayas. You've been there, I think, about 14 times. But I want you to be a travel guide in Indiana for a minute. What are some fun things to do in the Indianapolis area in the state of Indiana? Well, Indianapolis has become a great town. When I first moved here uh, in 1977, uh, its nickname was India No Place, uh, <laughs> sometimes referred to as the armpit of the Midwest. Um, but it's become really a, a great cultural center. Um, it's sometimes called the amateur sports capital of the world because we have so many uh, amateur and Olympic class events here. So sports are huge here. Um, but we also have uh, you know, an opera, um, many theaters, and going to theater tonight, as a matter of fact. And right. So, yeah. 
Go well, ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, you go ahead. It's fun to get a little travel perspective in Indiana. Any, any other things in the state of Indiana you can recommend for people to see? Well, in southern Indiana, uh, we go from very flat, sort of lots of corn and alfalfa fields to rolling hills, uh, ravines, and rivers. And it, in, in the fall, especially, it's really pretty with the uh, forest, uh, the leaves changing. I live on a river. I'm looking out my back window right now at river, and I see the trees changing into their autumnal colors. Um, so, you know, it, it's pretty once you get out of the strictly agricultural areas. Well, it's fun to get a little take on the city of Indiana, Jeff. We'll talk about the Himalayas in a minute, but I want to... I want you to give the listeners a little take on your on your home state. Now, by the way, this is a little footnote here, but there's actually kind of an interesting Seattle area connection to Indiana. There's various people in Washington State from Indiana who have done very well in the Pacific Northwest. I want to mention a few to you. Senator Maria Cantwell, our current senator, is Indiana native. The late Mariners broadcaster Dave Niehaus. Local broadcaster Mike Gastineau. Former Mariners president Chuck Armstrong. Rick Meyer, of course, from your hometown, played with the Seahawks. And Sean Kemp of the NBA has Indiana ties. So I don't know. There's a little bit of an interesting Indiana connection to the Pacific Northwest, isn't there, Jeff? Well, to make it even closer, uh, Senator Cantwell's father was my wife's father's scoutmaster. Uh, I'm sorry. He, my, my wife's father was his scoutmaster. Um and uh, the, the Basso Village Foundation, which you mentioned in, in your opening bio about me, uh, I resigned as president two years ago, and my successor, Joel Myers, is a Seattle resident. So uh, that's where our foundation is now headquartered in the U.S. Well, it's fun. Another little small, small, small world connection there. This is Paul Schneiderman, host of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with author... Lawyer, academic, and philanthropist Jeff Raceley. I don't know Senator Cantwell well, but I met her several times. When I see her sometime, I may mention that I uh, interviewed you, Jeff. Well, Jeff, I... Yeah, well, mention Bob Todd to her. Bob Todd. If, she, if that name rings a bell, yeah. I will. I will. I don't know her well, but but when I see her, I'll, I'll say hello to her and mention Bob Todd's name. Uh, Jeff, I asked you a little bit about travel in your state of Indiana, which was fun to get get your perspective, and you've organized a bunch of treks around the Himalayas. You've written some books about the Himalayas. Tell us about some of the work you do in the Himalayas, uh, Jeff. Well, I went uh, to Nepal to uh, trek up the Everest Base Camp Trail for the first time in 95 and fell in love with the splendor of the Himalayan peaks and and, and I love the high mountain culture, the Sherpas and the other tri ethnic tribal people that live in the area. So I just kept going back, uh, learned how to climb mountains and did a number of mountaineering expeditions. But also, because Nepal is such a very poor country, I wanted to give back to it. So eventually started a foundation focused in this one remote area called Bassa, and we've uh, built a couple schools and uh, hydroelectric plants and water project and a number of other uh, health clinics, and we're working on a permanent health clinic right now. Um, so, yeah. Um, what else can I tell you? Oh, great stuff, I, and I know you're a philanthropist, and did you enjoy the climbing in, in the Himalayas? Yeah, I did in a masochistic way, as <laughs> most, most athletes have, have a certain amount of masochism in us. Uh, I mean, it, it's the most difficult thing I ever did. Um, Preseason football practices are child's play compared to spending 12 to 14 hours straight uh, on a climb. So I bet, but it, it's but it's glorious. I mean, I the, the sense of the fulfillment and the spectacular views and comradeship with your climbing mates is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah, I had a climber on my show last year named Mark Patterson, a former NFL player who's done a lot of climbs. Do you find the climbing to be dangerous or is it more of a stamina thing? 
much more a stamina thing. I mean, there there are dangers. I was once uh, in an avalanche that killed three Nepalese porters uh, up higher than we were. Oh, gosh. Um, I wasn't hurt, scared. Um, but that's, you know, if you know what you're doing and you're, you're with a really top-notch guide, which we, we always have uh, uh, Sherpa climbing guides with us, uh, and your teammates are good, uh, the danger is really pretty minimal. Um, uh, but weather, you know, weather is, can change rapidly up there. Oh, I bet. Well, I salute the work you do in the Himalayas and the climbing and all that and the philanthropy. That's great. Paul Schneiderman of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with author, retired lawyer, and a man who's done many things. Jeff Raceley. Jeff, um, I read that you coach youth sports. I believe you wrote an article on the subject of youth sports. Tell us about what you have published on the subject of youth sports. Well, I wrote a couple articles. Uh, thematically, they were um, pretty much the same. And one of the fun things about that was uh, I got to talk with and quote Coach Bob Knight. Um, so I'm Sure, even way out there in Washington, you guys have heard of. Of course. Uh, but the, the theme was that kids ought to be introduced in athletics in a way which is, number one, fun. Uh, number two, teaches them some discipline. Uh, and number three, teaches them how to relate well with others. And if you, if you coach kids with those three things always in mind in the way you organize your practice and the way you encourage them during games, I think it's a wonderful experience. Um, But I've also seen some coaches and parents um, who don't keep those things in mind and turn it into a terrible experience for kids and don't set good examples. So, So that's what I was trying to get across with those articles. We'll have to read it when I have some time. Well, Bobby Knight, although he's an iconic coach and a very, very highly successful college basketball coach, Bobby Knight's tactics seem a little different than what you were teaching the kids, huh? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, indeed. Uh, I mean, he's a very complicated character. He's actually a very philanthropically inclined guy, although he, he kept that uh, pretty much confidential. Um, as, as, as in my John Ritter book, I mentioned how when John uh, was having so much trouble in his own life, um, Coach Knight let him know that his door was always open to him uh, for help. Uh, John, unfortunately, never walked through it, Coach Knight told me. But yeah, he definitely had personality issues. I mean, he has... His impulsiveness, his anger. I mean, there's certain ways he reminds me of our current president um, in his worst moments. And that eventually was his undoing. Yeah, so, that's an know, interesting got- analogy comparison between Bobby Knight and Donald Trump. That, that, that that's, that's, uh, I never really thought of that, that comparison, but there's something there. Well, Jeff, I want to talk about your great book, Hero's Journey, about John Ritter. Again, not the late actor, a famous Indiana, Indiana basketball player. But I want to talk about your book, Monsters of the Midway. And I read it this week, and it's a somewhat fictional account of the University of Chicago football program, a great academic institution with a lot of history. And, Jeff, I'm not saying your book by any means is exactly like the movie Animal House, but it does depict a lot of college students doing funny and sometimes wild stuff at the University of Chicago in the 1960s and 70s era. Has anybody in the University of Chicago community, Jeff, challenged your book anyway? <laughs> um, no. In fact, <laughs> I just got an email last week, coincidentally, from a person in the athletic department who told me that two new uh, hirees, staff members in, in the athletic department, had gotten the book because they wanted to learn more about the history of uh, University of Chicago athletics and football in particular. And I thought, well, that you know, that's great, but <laughs> they might be a little shocked about some of the hijinks that you right. alluded to that were definitely going on uh, in the early 70s. Fun book. And by the way, Jeff, when I read that book, when I read your John Ritter book, 
I could see both books hitting the big screen one day. Have any Hollywood producers approached you about making either your two sports books into films? No. Uh, I mean, I wish they would. I think that would be a wonderful experience to uh, see that happen to a book you wrote. Um, but no. Uh, and I, I have a son who's in that field. He's the tech supervisor for a, a film uh, and TV production company. But I think the last thing he want to do is work with his dad on the project. <laughs> Well, let's see. You never know down the road what can happen when someone writes a book. So you played on the University of Chicago football team in 1974 and 75. They were not winning teams. And in fact, People Magazine referred to the University of Chicago football program as the worst college football team in the country. Jeff, although you were not on winning teams, do you think the way you guys played kind of reflected the true spirit of being a student athlete? Yeah, in fact, I, I sort of presented a the philosophy toward what a, a student athlete or a scholar athlete should be in that book. Um, and I think the professionalization of college athletics, even high school athletics now, is a shame. Um, I think that, that, you know, my first principle for coaching kids, it should be fun, uh, has been completely lost. Uh, I mean, it, it's an industry it's a business, and the workers are the athletes, and that's not what sports meant to me. So I only went to practice two or three times a week um, because at Chicago we had a rule that if you had any academic reason to miss practice, uh, you could. So I intentionally scheduled classes to conflict with practice because I didn't think football was worth uh six days a week of my time when I was you know, trying to do well academically at a college as tough as Chicago was. This is Paul Schneiderman of Sports and Stuff on Rainier Avenue Radio with an author and retired attorney, Jeff Raceley. Jeff, real quickly, um, University of Chicago, and I, when I read your book, I really enjoyed the history about it. Your book is sort of a semi-fictional, but I, I enjoyed the the history of the University of Chicago. And I didn't realize it was such a Big Ten program at one time. Jeff, you're a University of Chicago alum. Would you ever like to see the University of Chicago become like a big time, Big Ten style program again in sports? Well, as a fan, I think it would be great. But for the student athletes there, I think it would be terrible. Um, it's just the football team has become a very good Division Three team. Um, and that's, you know, that's great on the one hand, and as long as the students uh, playing um, want to make that kind of commitment, okay, good for them. But the amount of time and effort that it takes away from academics just to be a top-notch Division three team, I think is too much. Um, and you know, that's one of the, the points I try to make in the book, is that life at every stage ought to be balanced. And when you give uh, so many hours uh, of practice and game time and travel time to a sport, your life just isn't balanced. I mean, you know, it, it ought to be primarily about academics when you're in college. Uh, and then sports can be a close and, but there's also social life and cultural life and so forth. And these athletes at that level you know, just have so little time for academics as well as just to enjoy life. Well, Jeff, I enjoyed your book, Monsters of the Midway. I'd recommend it to the listeners. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's just, it's kind of a, it's, it's fun to read a book about these very academic guys at a very elite academic institution playing football. I think it gave a unique perspective of the game and I, I enjoyed it. Well, Jeff, I want to move on to your great 2016 book, Hero's Journey about the late John, I'm sorry, not the late John Ritter, the John Ritter, the surviving uh, former football basketball player at the University of Indiana who played in your hometown. I, mean, I want to make sure I pronounce your hometown correctly this time. Goshen or Goshen, Indiana? Goshen. Goshen. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'm struggling with that a little bit. Um, and the book is about, also hits on the subject of heroism and how to define heroes. And Ritter was a great athlete who fell with some tough times after he finished 
college. And I want to get, I want you to give the Jeff, the listeners, we only have a few minutes left, a quick synopsis of how you decided to write a book about John Ritter, a man a few years ahead of you in high school in the town that you grew up in. Well, he, he was the greatest athlete that I had ever seen play any sport when I was a kid. And so uh, following uh, him uh, as a fan and just, uh, you know, somebody that knew him, um, watching him go on to IU, uh, be on Bobby Knight's uh, first NCAA Final Four team, and then was drafted by the Pacers and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Uh, you know, this is a great thing for a kid from a small town. And so I was always interested in what was going on in his life. Um, he didn't make it in the NBA. Uh, I heard he had gone to work at Eli Lilly Pharmaceutical, one of the biggest companies in Indiana. And then he just disappeared and nobody knew what happened to him. And so I, you know, was curious. But one day, a friend of mine calls me up and said, you wouldn't believe who I just met last night. Got in a cab, coming home from the airport. There's this big, fat, bald guy who's the cab license in the car says his name is John Ritter. And this guy had played for South Bend uh, against Ritter in high school. And he says, you wouldn't happen to be basketball John Ritter, and it is. And he proceeds to learn that John has become a homeless drunk. Um, so that really intrigued me, and uh, I wanted to find out more, and eventually I tracked John down and, and uh, uh, talked to him, and it intrigued me even more. Uh, so he declined to let me formally interview him for a book. Um, but so I began researching, uh, finding contacts uh, that had known him through every phase in his life, interviewing them, digging out old uh, newspaper articles about him, and you know, put together the the narrative of his life and. That's the launching pad for the book. No, it's a, it's a really great read. And I got a couple more questions for you, Jeff. We have less than five minutes left. But John would not agree to an interview for your book. And I don't believe he interviewed him as family members either. And so there's some gaps in the book about what exactly happened to John that led to him having hard times. Jeff, I got a thought for you and give me a response to this. Do you think in some respects it made the book more intriguing? There's some gaps in what exactly happened to John? Well, I hope so. Um, I know a little more than what's in the book um, okay. because because I was able to make a contact with his family, um, although not directly. It all came secondhand, and so I didn't use it um, because I didn't want to use what us lawyers would call hearsay. Sure. Uh, but... Yeah, I mean, at first I, I was really disappointed that he wouldn't agree to a formal interview, but we did have a few chats on the phone, um, and, and it was, the thing that was great about getting to talk to him was that by then uh, he had pulled himself out of the deep hole he'd been in. Good. Uh, he, he, he has a job, still has a job, and he actually works just to about a mile away from my house uh, as a sports ticket broker. Right. Saw it in the book. Jeff, you know, a lot of your book, and I really recommend the listeners read your book. This is Paul Schneiderman of Sports and Stuff. You're just tuning in with uh, the great uh, writer and former attorney Jeff Raceley and Jeff's book, Hero's Journey, about the basketball player John Ritter is terrific. But one thing in your book, Jeff, you write a lot about is you have sort of a philosophical, meditative perspective, as you describe it, about defining a hero and heroism. And so athletes and movie stars, even some politicians actually are dubbed as heroes. But I've always thought of like athletes and movie stars as more performers. Do we just need to change the paradigm of what a hero is, Jeff? Well, I, yes and no. Uh, I mean, we confuse the hero with celebrity uh, even uh, victims are, are being called heroes in our 
current culture. And I think that the term has really gotten uh, so diffused that it's almost lost any significant meaning. Um, where the traditional meaning uh, can apply to anybody who goes through, uh, who, who becomes uh, great in some way and then loses his greatness or her greatness and, uh, you know, basically loses everything, but then finds a way to climb out of that deep hole and create a new positive life. That's the traditional sort of mythical literary uh, description of the hero journey. And that's exactly the journey that John Ritter has gone through. And so that's what I, I wanted to try to redirect uh, our understanding of what hero means back to that more traditional, mythic, legendary sense of the word. Well, it's a very fascinating book, and it made me think a lot as a reader about what a hero is and defining heroism. I, I really enjoyed it. And when John went back, unfortunately, I have less than a minute left, Jeff. Hopefully, I'll get you back one day. When John got back to his hometown at some point, he needed some help. He didn't get a lot of help, but that's in the book. I don't want to give away the whole book. But, Jeff, we have less than a minute left. What's the future hold for uh, Jeff Raisley? Well, I'm still working to recruit people to go on Himalayan treks and tours and climbs, and I'm sure there will be another writing project that comes along. But I'll tell you, Paul, it's been really great to get to talk about uh, sports and philosophy because my life has been largely taken up with political stuff, which <laughs> is kind of painful and I'm kind of sick of it. But, sure. Uh, the, last, the last book was uh, about politics, so I'm kind of stuck with that for a while. I saw that, Jeff, and I wanted to get into a little more on politics in the show, but I decided to focus a little more on sports, other things, so I decided to for this show to take a little break from politics, but I know you've written about politics and I enjoy politics. Sometime I have you back, we, we can chat more about it. But Jeff, thank you so much for coming on Sports and Stuff. I really enjoyed our conversation. That's great talking to you, Paul, and I will look forward to the next time. You take care. Thanks, Jeff. You too. Bye-bye.